Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, this is the webinar Changes, How Nonprofits Turn and Face the Strange. Um, I'm Alex Reed, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Ed Spitzberg. Um, Ed and, and I are uh, friends from college and are pleased to discover in our adult lives that we have uh, much in common in uh, the nonprofit world. Um, Ed is uh, from the from the business side and the management side a, a, a an experienced nonprofit executive. Um, he's also a fundraiser and a strategic advisor. His company Spitzberg Advisors is um, uh, able to help organizations um, achieve their missions and uh, navigate through complex uh, changes and, and different environments that you might experience. So Ed uh, has, has really lived uh, much of the things that we'll be talking about today. Um, over to you, Ed. Great, and thanks for that intro, Alex. And I will now return the favor and, and introduce uh, Alex. Uh, in addition to uh, having practiced law for nearly uh, uh, 20 years and being a specialist in, in nonprofit law, um, just taking it up a level, to be a, a really good nonprofit attorney, uh, you not only need to know the law, you need to know governance, and to know about nonprofit governance, you need to know about nonprofit strategy, best practices, and more. And so uh, Alex is uh, bringing that that whole complete set of skills uh, to the conversation today and to, to the work generally of, of being a, a nonprofit expert across the board with the uh, legal kernel, but, but, but uh, more broadly to governance and nonprofit issues uh, writ large. Thanks, Ed. Uh, well, why don't you start us off with, uh, with the, uh, the overview of what we'll be discussing. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so today we'll be talking um, about change in general in nonprofits. And, and uh, uh, you may have heard there's a bunch of changes uh, in life in general these days. And so we're going to talk specifically about uh, the, the changes that nonprofits face day to day, month to month, year to year, and, and specifically now. Um, we'll be using the lens uh, mostly of looking at it through changes of each stage in a nonprofit uh, life cycle from uh, the startup phase of founder uh, to uh, all types of leadership transitions um, uh, and uh, then looking at uh, um, and leadership transition of course can be uh, staff leadership or board leadership and then we'll be looking at all types of uh, external changes there's there's legal issues that Alex will uh, have some good stories about uh, managing crises, whether they're uh, specific to your organization or uh, the world, like say a pandemic. Um, and changes aren't always just managing crises. There's also many opportunities that can be there. And we'll talk about how to seize those opportunities. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit um, before we, uh, as part of this introduction, uh, to talk a little bit about the, the concept of uh, the nonprofit life cycle a little bit. Um, First, you know, it's a, uh, there's, there's different types of uh, paradigms that uh, relate to where you are in your life cycle. If you are um, a startup, you're, you're dealing with different types of challenges that then change and evolve to when you are hiring your first uh, ED to when you're a mature organization. And maybe there's types of um, uh, changes that a mature organization should think both in terms of sustaining it, or perhaps uh, different types of partnerships that might be needed, or uh, other types of, um, of, of evolution. So uh, we want to think about those terms as we look through uh, 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 different types of um, changes that you've staged in the organization. Um, uh, and then I, I also want to talk a little bit, I think, before we start um, uh, the actual uh, meet of today, uh, talking a little bit about governance writ large, and I'll turn that over to Alex. Great. Um, and just so that you have the, the connection to, to Bowie, I think um, it's, it's good. So, so we, we, we were looking at, at David Bowie's song, uh, Changes, uh, Turn and Face the Strange. And it's interesting, I was just looking at um, what, he, what he meant by that song. It turns out uh, he was, you know, trying lots and lots of different things. He was trying to become famous any way he could. He was he was a model. He had like four or five different bands. He tried to do an Andy Warhol type thing and make other bands sing the songs that he was doing. And then 
he just came up with this character, Ziggy Stardust, which was strange, truly strange. And boom, he became this international celebrity and, you know, force that we know, uh, know him today. So his, his song, uh, Changes, is, is about his own transition to turn inward uh, and, you know, bring out his you know, his, his true self, his, his Ziggy Stardust. Um, he says, time may change me, but I can't trace time. I always misheard it as I can't change time, but I can't trace time and he can't uh, foretell the future. So that's, that's um, some, something to, to think about uh, today as, as we uh, you know, talk about how organizations can um, navigate through change. Um, first of all, just uh this is a a, a brief little uh overview of, of governance um governance is in large part what nonprofits do governance is the mixture of a nonprofit's mission with its activities so it's it's at the deepest level how an organization manifests what it is about. So governance is, um, you know, I used to think of it as a kind of a very small subcategory uh, of, of the law, you know, yeah, you have to follow some fiduciary duties, uh, but they're sort of, it's sort of like common sense. But the more I've studied it and, and uh, worked with clients through complicated issues, the more I realized that it's it's the very essence of what it means to be a nonprofit organization. And it has some of the most interesting uh, and, and complex and rich uh, legal questions come out of the governance space. So um, just a, a couple of, of highlights of, of what we talk about when we talk about governance. Um, we talk about corporate formalities. Um, that is the formal written record of the nonprofit's existence, what decisions it makes and why. Uh, it's sort of like a diary, uh, and it is the way that uh, that a nonprofit uh, remembers itself over time and projects itself into the future. Um, so those those formalities are extremely important, both for protecting the fiduciaries and invoking the business judgment rule, um, which is a way of protecting your your decisions, uh, even if they cause damage um, by showing that you made the decision in good faith and with full information available to you, you did your best. Um, that's that's a, another important aspect of, of those corporate formalities. Um, I wanna talk about levels of responsibility in governance. Every organization has an answer to these questions but they are different answers uh, depending on the organization and what it's trying to achieve. So for every organization, there is somebody or some group of people who has the power to appoint the board, call those members. Uh, every organization has some group of people who are legally vested with all the powers of the organization. Those are the directors. Every organization has some group of people to whom are delegated the day-to-day -day management and implementation of the decisions made by those oversight uh, directors. We call those managers the officers and uh, organizations also have individuals who are delegated specific tasks by those officers. And those are generally employees or independent contractors. You can call them different things, each of these types of, of, of functions, executive director, CEO, president, chair of the board. Some organizations have quote unquote board officers, which I personally find raises a lot of, of confusion, but um, these are uh, different ways of expressing the organization's mission and, and how, it, how it works. Um, governing documents are incre incredibly important. These are your, your articles, your bylaws, your policies, your procedures, um, the things that, 
that really describe uh, your aspiration of how the organization should behave. Fiduciary responsibilities are codified in state law and in the common law, but they also describe the, uh, the relationship between officers and the organization or directors and the organization. How, what, what it means to be a governor or a, a prudent governor. Um, and lastly, the documenting change, the importance of minutes, that, that diary will we'll hit that uh, multiple times throughout this presentation. Back to you, Ed. Great, I think we'll talk about uh, the startup phase right now. Um, and, and actually, you know, right back to you for that first bullet, Alex, to talk about launching a nonprofit and all this involved in that. Sure, so the first thing I say, um, we can start a nonprofit with all we need to know is the name. We need to know uh, the, the three recommended, three directors and, and officers. They can be the same individuals. Um, and we need to know, um, you know, roughly speaking, what the organization is going to do. And, and uh, with that information, we can, incorporate in state, uh, typically Delaware, because they have such a user-friendly corporate code, um, but other states are what uh, can be used as well. Um, we form the, the Articles of Incorporation, which is the agreement between the state and the nonprofit that says, yes, you may create a perpetual corporation uh, with, with existence that that goes uh, that goes on forever uh, uh, with these basic um, governing requirements. Um, those requirements enable you to qualify for tax exempt status, but that's granted by the IRS. So you have to fill out a Form 1023 exemption application with the federal government to get that tax exempt status. So it's separate from the state status that you get from uh, the, the your existence comes to you from the state. Your tax status comes to you from the federal government. Um, you also will adopt your uh, your basic policies, your conflict of interest policy, whistleblower um, uh, document retention policy, um, and authorize your your officers to go out and open a bank account and, and do basic corporate actions. So once you've done all of that and filed your exemption application, you're you're launched and. Um, uh, and then it's on to some of the challenges and changes uh, that, that Ed will talk about. Great, thanks, Alex. And yes, exactly. So you've got now the the, the uh, nonprofit's launched. It's doing great mission centric work. Um, and uh, now it's been launched for let's say a few years. And then there's some changes that happen internally. And and uh, I'm sure everyone here has talked about uh, and heard of, of founder syndrome. Let me back up one uh, level though to say. Founders are awesome. They're amazing. They are making something out of nothing. They, they are, they're always, uh, usually full of energy and 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 have um, gotten a lot of people to follow them to do the great work they're doing. So uh, uh, please don't take that to be a knock on founders. And, and actually, in a minute, uh, when we get to leadership transitions, I'm going to talk about an amazing founder that I uh, had the uh, pleasure, the the luck to uh, be the the. the receiving end of the transition who did some great work in that regard. So founders are great, but there is a, <laughs> there's others, but they're, 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 uh, because it's often their baby, uh, it's nonprofit, it's sometimes that they've created, it's sometimes uh, there, there's some very common, um, uh, sometimes obstacles to change or, or actually things that, that are needed to drive change that happen. Um, uh, oftentimes founders can be um, resistant to change. Uh, they want to do things the way they've been done. Um, and often that relates to something else is that oftentimes the founders have been doing the bulk of the work or um, the way they've been themselves. So they have, uh, they have sometimes don't delegate as much as more mature organizations. So there's not only the way that uh, founders have been doing it that can be part of founder syndrome, but the fact that they have been doing everything and institutional knowledge then relies and um, stays with them. So that it can be an obstacle and a barrier for change. Um, uh, in addition, going hand in hand with the, the founder, uh, him or herself, there's then the founding boards. Founding boards can often be a group of uh, founders' friends or, or the first people that supported the, uh, the, the nonprofit. Um, 
they are often much more focused on, uh, they are often very hands-on in doing the actual management of the organization with the founder sometimes. Uh, hopefully, uh, as the organization has evolved, that has transitioned in what they've been doing, doing more fundraising and, and governing, um, uh, which it should be doing the whole time. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. Um, I also want to point out that we talk about founder and founding boards here, but founders can also be, the, the founder, the issues that I just mentioned in founders can often be found with long time non-founding EDs as well. So an ED that's been there for you know, half a decade or a decade or more, but not the initial uh, ED can have a lot of those issues too of having done things their way, um, done more, uh, more than they should. Uh, that's prevented them, well, uh, let me back up one sense, sense too, that it's oftentimes the founder is doing more than they should for one set of uh, activities. It often means that they're probably not doing another set of activities that are that's great for a, um, a founder to, or an executive director to do. So for instance, a executive director who's, who knows how to do X, Y, and Z, very specific um, operational activity for the nonprofit that someone else on staff could do, but they still do that. Well, that's less time that the, nonprofit, that the, the uh, executive director could be going out and raising money or spreading the word about what the nonprofit does in the community. Um, so, uh, and oftentimes that the board roles uh, in, in a founding board can be ad hoc and unaligned so that someone might be doing fundraising because they brought in the first gift but not really a fundraiser or, or something else that just sort of happens to be where the roles are attached to the people that were there at the beginning instead of organized committees and, and planning of what the board should be doing. So. Uh, Alex and I are quickly going to talk about um, uh, how do you achieve change here uh, in from the startup to the next phase, and certainly board recruitment. You want to make sure that you're strategically recruiting the right people for the next phase of the board. And we're going to talk about board evolution in, in a moment. But if you're lacking in some uh, uh, fundraising networks, you can recruit for that. If you need some legal help, you can recruit for that. If you're no one really understands in the board uh, numbers. You can recruit for that, but really getting the right board for your next phase of evolution. Um, and then, of course, succession planning for the founder. That's uh, really important. And, and then staff at large, uh, understanding what happens when a staff member, especially the executive director, leaves is something that can and should be planned for, and that will really, really help the change when that happens. We're going to talk about that in leadership transitions just a bit more um, in a moment. And I'll talk about hiring and onboarding, how that works with leadership transitions as well. But Alec, what, what, what other uh, types of uh, things can achieve the change at this stage? Well, you know, I think the most important thing, uh, as with all governance questions, the most important thing is what is the mission? What are we trying to achieve? Um, because different missions will dictate different uh, strategies and different types of specialists can be more or less helpful depending on, on what you're trying to do. Um, so for example, um, some organizations need scale and that scale uh, can only really be achieved through, uh, through a government action or multilateral government action. So perhaps your, your next move uh, is to bring in somebody who can uh, raise awareness to issue advocacy with policymakers, um, which is you know maybe an unusual uh, approach or something you might not have, have thought of when you're thinking, I need, I need to grow and scale my organization. What do I need? Probably need money, but what am I gonna spend that money on and, and how am I gonna do it? How am I gonna achieve that, that scale? Um, so another uh, key point in, in um, bringing, going into the, to the next phase and bringing in new directors is um, how to entice uh, people to be on your board. So one important thing to, to, to look at that anyone who is considering being on a board will look at is you know, is the organization in a in a good state? Um, are its policies in order? Does it does it have some obvious legal problems that need to be addressed? 
um, you know, is it in good standing in the state it's uh, organized in? Has it filed its Form 990 with the IRS? Um, does it have an insurance policy uh, that covers directors and officers? You know, particularly if you're trying to bring on a wealthy director uh, to help with fundraising, uh, that director is going to want to make sure that they're not their personal assets aren't um, going to be uh, jeopardized by by serving on the board. Um, so there, there's a, a fair amount of, 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 of getting one's house in order uh, needed in order to attract the type of talent that can help an organization scale up. Thanks, Alex. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, leadership transitions in a little bit more detail here, uh, especially the, uh, at least to start with the um, founder to the first hired ED. And uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind for any transition, whether it's from a founder or otherwise, is how involved should a um, should it, the outgoing executive director be in the transition? And you know, I think the answer to that is they should be involved a lot in the planning for the transition. And we're one thing that Harris talked a lot about here is planning for these changes. So they should be involved in the succession planning. They should be able to document as much as possible what they do. How is the new ED onboarded? What qualities does the um, ED role, in their view, require? Uh, uh, what has you know being self-reflective? What qualities has the ED role been just because of that person that doesn't necessarily need to be? What the ED role is going uh, forward, and that these conversations should be with the board, because ultimately it is the board that's going to be involved in the hiring of the new ED. So uh, you know the, the the founder or or the outgoing ED at any stage um, probably should not be involved in the interviews or selection, and that's really a, a or even the actual creation of the um, the, uh, the 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 uh, job description because they should be very much providing a lot of input um, on the front end to the board. The board should then be able to make a really good uh, uh, description in, in the hiring process. And then, and then the ED, should, if, uh, ideally, should, can be involved in the onboarding stage. Obviously, that can't or, or won't always happen. But that would be the, um, the ideal part of it. And also, one important part here is the communications of that change. There's a lot, anytime this happens, there's a lot of communication that needs to be handled really, really well. Um, communicating to all your stakeholders, your funders that this change is happening to, uh, of course, the people that the nonprofit's serving, the mission focused, uh, the, the, the mission of the organization, um, possibly depending on the organization, the press. So making sure that, that there's, a, there's a plan for all of that um, in advance can make it be executed really, really well. Uh, Something else, um, actually, before we get to that, I, I want to very briefly just, uh, and I think we're, I want to make sure we have enough time to get to all everything, so I'll do this quickly. But I, as I mentioned before, I was the uh, beneficiary of a really well executed succession plan. I had nothing to do with it. I was the receiving end of it. I was the successor. Um, but when I, I did succeed a founder who did not have founder syndrome, um, other than the fact that all founders do, I mean, this, the, the organization that I succeeded her in was, uh, um, you know, was, she founded and she was passionate about it. And she certainly did things the way that that uh, were, was right for her at the time. Um, but, uh, uh, but also she and the board really planned the transition really well. They, um, uh, they uh, made a, a job description that was, uh, they were trying to hire for the next phase of the organization, not to replace her directly as such, but to really think ahead to the next phase. They uh, um, were, they even, they had set up uh, a, one of the, one of the people on the board was a, um, ran a firm of leadership coaches and they were without, uh, not even knowing who the new ED was, they had arranged for a few months of confidential leadership coaching to help with the transition. They communicated very, very well to, uh, uh, about the transition to all the constituents. And then I, in turn, when I, when I uh, came on, my job was to then communicate the change myself. Uh, and that it's very important that the new ED is an active part of that communications because uh, the, it's very easy if you're not introducing yourself to people as a new person, you're just the abstract new guy, the new person. And that can be uh, not being defined or identified as an actual person, that can be actually 
cause a lot of damage under the radar where you know, people are worried about, well, are they gonna change the organization? Are they gonna destroy the organization? Are they gonna fire me if they're staff members? Um, are they going to not make the organization what I want? And I think once you're, it's very important to make the communication directly from the new person so that they can really be a person attached to that. Um, I wanna quickly uh, talk about interim executives, which, is, which can be really helpful uh, in, uh, in terms of um, these transitions. Um, uh, I have served and indeed right now I'm serving as an interim executive as well. Um, and just really quickly, the benefits of an interim ED, uh, there, there's quite a few of them. And, uh, first of all, uh, it gives the time, it gives the board time to do a thoughtful search. Uh, the one thing you don't want to ever have as a board is an accidental interim where you're doing a rushed hire and you hire someone that's not the right person, right fit for right reason, and they're only there for a year or whatever a short amount of time would be for that organization. And then you have to do it all over again and you want an interim to be there uh, for the right reasons. Um, also an interim can sort of, anytime there's change, it's just the nature of an organization, um, this leadership change. There are things that, you know, you gotta go under the hood and see what's, what's, all, what's, what's easily or not, maybe not easily uh, fixed or changed to make the organization more robust for the new ED. And it's really helpful to have let the interim Come in with fresh eyes and do that so that the hired ED can look forward and not have to necessarily uh, fudge with the motor quite as much. Um, uh, there's always the, the fresh perspective that an outside person brings um, and it should be an outside person. I'll talk about that with the structure in a second. And of course, um, uh, they, depending on the status of the old ED, the, the interim ED can really be a great training mechanism for the onboarding of the new um, incoming ED. Um, and as part of the tinkering also, the, the interim is sort of, a, in a way, a, an, an outside consultant that can give an organizational assessment to the board of what's really going on in the organization and how that can relate to the new permanent ED that they're, they're bringing in. Uh, and finally, on the communications piece, it's demonstrating to the staff, to the, uh, to the community, to the uh, people that the organization is serving, that there is continuity and that the organization is not at risk. It's not uh, that that change is good, and it's and, and it's just a, a transition to the new ED. Um, really quickly, on terms of structures, I won't go into too much detail, but there can there can be a lot of ways that this um, is structured. Matter of fact, for time, I'll probably skip over this and happy to talk more uh, if anyone wants to. Um, my, our, my email will be at the end. What I do want to say um, is that the uh, interim uh, should not be um, a candidate for the permanent job. Um, it's it's a, all the things I mentioned that are benefits, that some of them are, are, um, that are not as strong if there is someone who's also trying to get the permanent job for themselves. It's the outside perspective, trying to fix things, even if it ruffles some feathers. Uh, you're not trying to please the board to get hired. You're trying to, um, when I'm an interim, my, um, my client is obviously the board and they hire me, but really I think of it more as the organization writ large, the mission my, uh, my client, and therefore I'm able to make decisions based on what I think is best for the organization, which might be different if I'm trying to do what I think the board will necessarily like the most. And hopefully those align most of the time, um, but, but not always. Um, there, now, Alex and I, I think we're both gonna talk a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, we're talking about planned transitions here. Transitions uh, ideally are planned, but some, a lot of times they're not. Um, uh, you can plan for the general transition. The fact that your ED will someday leave, um, you can plan for, but uh, it, might, it might be sudden. Or there's sometimes many types of, of um, transitions, parental leave, um, illness, things like that. Uh, but the more you plan, um, the more able you are to handle those. Um, I want to also, and Alex, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of going forward here, but please feel free to interrupt me at any, any time. Um, in terms of sudden transitions or unplanned transitions or even planned transitions, one thing that's really important is to, um, the, the, the transition will be more successful the more engaged your remaining staff is. So a staff that's already at burnout um, is going to have a hard time with the transition. So it's just another reason to think about uh, what what your what the organization's capacity and what the organization's human resources are year round all the time 
um, because the healthier the organization is going into transition, the healthier the transition is going to be. Um, and I know it says here, um, the relationship between management and board, uh, that's always important, um, whether it's the, the outgoing ED, the transition uh, ED, the interim ED, or the successor ED. Um, and uh, a lot of times I've certainly seen um, organizations where that, where one part of that relationship might be an issue um, uh, or uh, where the roles are unclear. So that's another thing that, that it's important to have clear um, the, the roles of management and board prior to any transition because um, that's, that again, the healthier and, and clearer that relationship is, the better the transition will go. Yeah, so one, one example of that, or a, a question that I, I get a lot is, um, should the CEO, should the head manager, the president, the executive director, whatever you want to call that person, should that head manager also sit on the board? Um, should that person also be uh, engaged in oversight um, with the board, or should uh, should that president, chief executive officer, uh, purely be in a reporting role to the board? Um, I'm, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts, Ed. I, I, I've seen different, <clears throat> different uh, examples of that. <clears throat> Generally, the more mature an organization is, the more uh, I prefer to see a separation between management and uh, oversight, because oversight it really has to, you know, sets management's compensation, and um, you know, really needs to uh, distinguish its its oversight role from the managerial role. And so, blurring it, even just with respect to one board seat, can be uh, can be problematic. But at an earlier stage in the development, it might make more sense to align oversight and management a bit more. I agree that, um, and, and the way the distinction you've drawn between early stage and, and later stage, um, usually the founder will will want to be on the board, and that's fine. Um, uh, but yes, the 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 oversight and the management distinction you mentioned is really key, and that's often what does get blurry, even without the board seat. So you don't want to blur it more. Um, the management should really the 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 lead manager, the ED, should have. Uh, close to complete authority for um, the hiring and firing of other staff, for making the the strategy work, certainly for inputting on this, input on the strategy, um, but but for really executing the mission is 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 should be completely with the staff leadership, and that sometimes gets a little muddled. On the other hand, um, the the manager shouldn't necessarily have to try to manage the board, and the board can, uh, uh, and that's. That distinction is easier for mature, more or more mature organizations, where, um, as you said, that I don't think that the ED should indeed be on the board. Now, there's also that middle ground of the um, ex officio member of the board, um, right. where, where there there is a voice, um, and uh, but not as a vote. So ex officio means proceeding from the office of. So if you're a a, a director, um, ex officio. Uh, you know, simply by virtue of being an officer, then you automatically serve on the board. That's that's what ex officio means. And as soon as you are no longer uh, an, an officer, the, your your seat on the board also disappears. Um, so so it can be a, a way of just automatically putting that person in to to uh, oversight as needed. You can also give uh, reduced voting rights to the ex officio members so that uh, officers who serve ex officio on the board maybe don't have a vote or only have vote on certain topics. Okay, let's see, let's move on to uh, board evolution. Um, we have, <clears throat> we have here the, you know, kind of different, different phases or, or transitions. Um, you know, Ziggy Stardust to uh, some of the later incarnations of, of David Bowie. He kept re uh, re-examining himself and, and reinventing himself, which is uh, uh, you know incredible in one 
human being, but uh, uh, pretty necessary for a perpetual, infinite lived organization. I mean, nonprofits are, and nonprofit corporations exist forever. Uh, and many of them are, you know, more than 100 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, you have to imagine that there's going to be some pretty significant changes um, in, in how it operates and, and who's involved and, and what it's trying to do over the course of its, of its perpetual life. So we talked about leadership, which is more management. This is board evolution, which is more oversight. Um, oversight means a lot of things. One thing it does not mean, however, is management, and so, or and certainly not micromanagement. So that's that's one of the key issues that um, is very difficult to um, to parse and and to prevent boards from um, executing their oversight powers uh, diligently and thoughtfully. You know, trust but verify. Um, you know, you can get to the bottom of, of issues that could be, uh, that could, could create legal liability or problems for an organization. Uh, don't just be a, a yes person to, to management um, versus actually managing yourself and doing activities uh, on, on behalf of the organization, entering contracts, hiring and firing. Um, you know, doing doing things that are you know of employees, doing things that are that are uh, best left to management. Um, so I, I say that because you know in each of these stages, you're going to have different phases. At the, at, the, at the founding, you know, it's it's uh, everyone's kind of doing everything. Um, those those distinctions between management and oversight are often very blurry. You know, we need somebody, we got to open a bank account. So anyone know a, a bank who can help us open a bank account? You know, and you find board members physically going to a bank and opening a bank account for the, for the organization. And, um, you know, that, that's the type of thing that normally would be a, a, an officer job, um, but it's the, the roles are very, are very blurry. A governing board is, you know, after you've, you've kind of, you've got your thing, you know what you're doing and you need to keep it going and you need to build it and, and, and grow it. That's, that's where you need um, board members who have a, a more of an appetite for um, creating policies and, and thinking thoughtfully and carefully about uh, how, how to structure uh, oversight and, um, and, and, and govern really truly govern an organization and not just do things. Um, uh, Ed, do you want to talk about um, the, the uh, divisions of labor and fundraising boards and, and other, uh, other things that you've seen in your experience that have, that have worked well? Sure, and I think uh, kind of um, adding on to what you were saying before, uh, as wearing my hat, um, less of a consultant and more of an interim ED or, or as an ED, um, I really like to see the board generally and then often the board chair as a, as a partner. So there's, that there's very clear division, you know, ED is going to hire, buyer, um, you know, uh, execute the budget and, and not have to worry so much about things that are within that budget. The board's going to do a lot of the oversight and set the budget and set the overall strategy. Um, but uh, one thing that's certainly true is being uh, an ED is in a way you don't, it's hard to have peers to talk to. Uh, you know, you, you certainly want to involve the staff in decisions and um, uh, and you uh, want to talk to um, the board writ large, but you're, you're reporting to a board writ large. It's nice to have um, a partner in the board chair, especially to, or, um, to talk through uh, challenges in the organization and, and work that through to manage the changes as they happen. Um, uh, actually, I think Alex, uh, yeah, we've talked a little bit about this. I think just to make sure we hit everything, I, maybe we should yeah. move on to the to, uh, the next part. External changes, legal controversies. That sounds like something I should talk about. Um, so, yeah, so external changes and legal controversies 
often go hand in hand. Um, so legal controversies, you know, misconduct allegations, tax controversies with the IRS, uh, attorney general investigations, any type of, um, of, of issue, the attorney general uh, of the state of incorporation and often the state in which you uh, raise funds and, and operate, um, have powers to come in and, uh, and really make sure that the way that the organization is operating is uh, in the public interest. Um, the attorney general has standing um, by virtue of that office to come in uh, to any organization and, and, and take a look at it. Um, so these are, these are the types of things that can really, um, you know, create a lot of, of change, sometimes an unexpected or an unwanted change as a result of the resolution of those conflicts and a misconduct allegation. You know, you might have a, a, an executive step down or resign or be fired or terminated. As a result of a tax controversy, you might have um, a whole line of business that is uh, spun off into a taxable subsidiary because the IRS concludes that it's it's not operated uh, for for charitable purposes and it needs to be, you know, a taxable piece um, or some other policy or procedure that you're uh, engaged in that that needs to change in some fundamental way or you know the attorney general I've seen them come in and say, guess what? Everybody who is on the board, you're off the board. We don't want you on this organization anymore because you know you haven't been governing properly. Um, they can do that. They can, uh, they can require fundamental changes to your, to your governing documents, um, usually depending on the severity of perceived wrongdoing. Um, you know, so, so those, um, those types of, of events can be very traumatic and, and significant in a, a life cycle of an organization. I just want to point out, though, in, in terms of external changes, you know, uh, we hear a lot these days about um, Me Too and um, issues with uh, diversity, equity and inclusion um, that, uh, that, are, that drive a lot of change within an organization. And, and there, there's what's happening is a, a, a shift externally, socially, you know, in, in the, the zeitgeist, there's a, um, you know, a change of norms, a change of standards uh, in the world in which nonprofits operate. And uh, this, if you're slow to adapt to those changing norms, you might find that you're out of step and you, you know, with the, with the external environment, and that uh, legal controversies ensue. So that's that's something that we're seeing a lot of. I think I, I would say these days with um, with a number of internal investigations. You know, the the, the people their defense is I it used to be fine what I did, and it's not anymore. You know, and it's like well, you know, get with the times, get with the times. Uh, Ed, over to you. Oh, you're on mute. I was writing an answer to Rachel's uh, question, um, uh, so I, I'll just uh, I'll just quickly say it before we uh, turn it over. Um, so Rachel, uh, thanks for your, your question about uh, the the um, the difference between, uh, as I'm understanding it, uh, the difference between having a hard line between governance and over and management, and working collaboratively. And and I want to learn more about appreciative inquiry that what, what you mentioned specifically. But I do think that the partnership is is um, uh, needs to be collaborative in order. I like the problem solving I was mentioning before. Um, and Joan Gary, who's a nonprofit expert, um, many of you uh, might have heard of, and she's great. Uh, I recommend her book. Um, she has a great metaphor about the board and the uh, ED um, uh, being twin and uh, being separate engines of a of a of a dual en twin engine plane, um, and that <laughs> both of them they need to work in concert. Uh, work, work, <laughs> out. Um, so. Uh, so that's a, that's a quick, vague answer to your question, Rachel. And I do want to learn more about appreciative inquiry specifically. Um, but also, if we can go, go to the next slide. Yes. Bit. And I see we've got about uh, a little more than 10 minutes left. So I'll make sure we stay on target. And if there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the, uh, the chat. 
and we'll try to allow time for that. We'll see how, how, we, how we go or answer them, answer them as we go. So uh, certainly one crisis uh, some that, that involved change that we uh, um, can uh, think of over the past couple of years is the COVID-19 pandemic. And certainly it's changing day to day, as we all know. Um, uh, and looking at everyone's responses to this is a great example of, of unplanned change. Uh, there's always so much you could do to, to manage this, right? In advance to plan for this. And we spoke about the, the importance of having in succession planning to have a plan that you can then implement. But things like this, the planning sort of happens as you go, right? So, that, so for the pandemic, there's the emergency. Oh no, what do we do right now? We have to shut down our office. Uh, certainly, um, and this is true across the nonprofit world and across the world at large, but looking at arts organizations, they you know look at their specific problems. Then not only is the, is it the office, um, you know the the how they work internally, but of course their what they do is present the arts or education, working with children. All these things had to change um, change immediately and uh, and in the best ways that people could at the time. Um, different people were different organizations were trying different things and it and um, with different amounts of success and different amounts. Of, and then of course the external environment has continued to change in terms of what, when people could get back together or if they can, depending on what you're doing and what your community is and in what ways. So uh, um, you know, we talk about adaptive change uh, here on the slide, but really it's 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 making the changes. It's, it's, it's doing it in the emergency um, to make sure that you're able to provide the services that you can to keep the organization running um, to the extent that you can, um, and then make the changes during. Now, where we are right now, and I say this loosely because, of course, who knows where we are in the pandemic right now, but in general, this, this part of the pandemic we're in, organizations are looking at the changes that they made hastily, and, so, and now, now the changes that they want to make going forward. So taking a look and seeing what changes have you made that, that worked for the pandemic? What changes have you made that worked beyond the pandemic? This is actually a good thing. Maybe for the arts organizations, maybe maybe streaming theater is, is going on in conjunction with live theater or, or um, maybe uh, virtual events are giving you a rider uh, in, in terms of education events, uh, education classes might be giving you a, a wider reach and you're, you're doing some of that too. So take a look at what changes you did just for the pandemic that were um, only for that, what changes uh, were working that you want to keep, and, and, and then looking ahead and just seeing what your future, uh, what, what, how you can use, and, and how do you want to adapt for the future changes that you expect to come. So a lot of organizations have done the first few things already, the, the, the changes that they have to do and the, um, the, the keep things going. And the, uh, the, the, the most adaptive organizations are now in the process of doing that other part where they're looking and really seeing what they're doing because, they, uh, uh, because they're working and what will continue to work uh, beyond the, um, the pandemic. Now there's a, uh, I'll tell the story as quickly as possible or this, this uh, apocryphal story. Uh, there's, there, there's a story of a dad who uh, kept making um, a, a roast uh, every, um, every big holiday and the way he would make it is he cut two sides off of uh, the roast and throw the meat away and, and then put the, um, the roast in the oven. And after many years of that, finally, uh, his, his daughter who's grown up said, um, why, did you, uh, why do you cut off both sides of the roast? And the dad said, well, that's the way my mom made it. And so uh, she, she, the daughter then asked the grandmother, well, why did you cut off the sides of the roast? And she said, well, you know, we had a really small oven when you were growing up and we just cut it off that way because that's how it fits. So the guy, the, the dad was doing it wrong or doing it because that's the way he knew, but the circumstances have changed. So that's really important to keep in mind for this, uh, as you're making these, um, all these changes, what, what works with the current circumstances and as the circumstances change, making sure you do um, as well. And then uh, Alex, wanna talk a little bit about seizing opportunities? Sure, so, you know, one of the uh, things I think we're, we're experiencing it at this very moment uh, is the, um, we're seizing the opportunity of using these virtual technologies, uh, these to, to communicate, these virtual communication methods 
that have existed for years, but we just never used them because we didn't have to. Um, and now that we are using them, we're finding that they enable us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. And we can also do things that uh, in a way that is that is helpful, you know, we're, we're able to to have meetings that have redu that don't have as much of an environmental impact as, as flying and driving everybody to the same place in order to do to do a, a, a live a live meeting. We're able to, you know, do it across time zones, uh, you know, geographic reaches is, isn't a problem. So I, I think, you know, there's uh, those types of, 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 of opportunities just implicit in in uh, major changes like this. Also, you know, sometimes, um, you know, an, an opportunity to to work from home or to work in a different geography enables uh, families and individuals to think about their lives in a new way. Um, and uh, it, it enables a, a different, more, more holistic or, or thoughtful approach to how do I want to be? How do I want my profession uh, my professional development to evolve and and an organization might might realize gosh i you know i don't need to be as insistent on everyone being local i can i can allow a little more geographic spread in my uh in my employees um and you know they'll be happier and still productive so so there 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 are some some um some nice surprises and and uh and, and opportunities that result anytime the old order is abolished and a new order comes into being great and i think i'm going to quickly um before we i think the next we're, we're almost ready to conclude alex i believe if i'm getting my yeah, break so then let me just right. quickly answer farah's question if i may um uh before we do the conclusion um she's writing the q a uh, about handling board succession issues we talked about Leadership staff staff leadership succession. We have not really talked about board succession, so thank you for asking that. Um, I, I, so, so uh, in a way, it's the, the same idea about planning for and making a structure to work with that. Um, uh, because you, what one thing that many organizations do is have a chair, vice chair, or president, vice president um, of the board uh, structure, where the uh, the vice chair is automatically uh, the successor to the president. They know as they are the vice chair that they will be in that role. Um, that's uh, advantageous, not just for the reason that you're asking about, that you know who the next president's going to be, um, but they know, and they know that who next president's going to be. But they also, in a way, have a year or two or three, whatever the term is, to get used to that role, to learn how the, the role and be very, much more successful when they go into it. Um, I, now you're asking a person who's one more thing quickly, Alex, because she's asking yeah. in the situation you're in right now, Farah, I understand you don't have that, and that, that, that's not terribly helpful to you at this moment. Um, but I also would say that it, going back to board recruitment for the right stage of the, uh, yeah, okay, now you just, you just chimed in there. Right, so I, I understand that. <laughs> so um, uh, then nobody wants to be with you either uh, right now. So in terms of recruiting the right board for the right time, uh, that's another way to handle this since you have, I believe, uh, uh, one more year is work heavily on board recruitment. And there's nothing that says that the board president has to be a longtime member of the board. Uh, or often that's the case, but you can start looking externally to get, uh, it tells me that maybe you don't have the right board right now for the organization if no one wants to be president. So you probably should be recruiting for board members anyway. And you can recruit for a board member with the, um, uh, where one at least one of the board members is uh is intending to be president i'll just chime in uh, and add that the issue of term limits is a, is a big one and we, we encounter this in writing uh your governing documents you know it, it's on the one hand uh some people like term limits because it says okay if i'm going to serve on this board i know how long i have to do it and then i'm done and so you know I want a term limit. On the other hand, uh, it creates built-in succession problems because people term out and then you have to find a replacement and you may not want, uh, that might not be the, the moment that it's, uh, it's in, in the organization's best interest to go searching for someone to fill that seat. So I typically prefer no term limits um, and to just have that open and honest conversation with board members you know, when you're ready to, to leave the board, 
you know, let's talk about it. Um, and until then, you know, give, give us some advance notice so that we can uh, do succession planning for your seat. But, um, you know, having an automatic, um, robotic uh, succession uh, or, or termination, I guess I should say, not, not the succession part because you can't find the next person to fill the seat, I, I think can, can raise uh, its own problems. So Alex, I think we're just about out of time. Why don't you go yeah. to the next slide? People have our contact information. Oh, yes. Talk, talk through the, the conclusion, which you know, the, the basic theme here is um, the, the planning and flexibility go hand in hand. As much as you can possibly plan for, plan for and think about it way ahead. Um, and then, but be flexible because it's not going to be the way you plan it, no matter how good your planning is. Um, so that, that's our, our bottom line here. And please feel free to. Uh, reach out to us, uh, contact information is there for um, the various ways that uh, Baker Hostetler and Alex and Statistic Advisors and myself uh, can, can help. And we can talk a little bit more about that, but I to make sure you had our, um, our contact information before people start dropping off at the hours. I'm sure you, you will and should. Uh, we thank you very much for your, for your time today. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. And, and thank you, Ed, for, for joining me here. Yeah, thanks, Alex.